Okay, First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter number 11, please turn there. And as we come to this portion of Scripture, we're in the final section of the book. Uh, I, like to, I like to see the flow of a book and kind of divide it into sections and as it moves and progresses through. Um, this last section, chapters 10 through 13, Paul has to defend and vindicate his apostleship uh, from his critics and even some of his friends because the Corinthians themselves have, have um, taken in other voices and Paul is concerned. He's worried about the, about the influence that others have on the Corinthians because if you don't recognize the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul and you begin to mingle and mix other truth and other message within it, you weaken the message. You, you, you water it down. And Paul is afraid of the Corinthians um, that, they might, that they might succumb. Um, and there's, there's people that are criticizing him and having, pointing out trivial things. Um, in chapter 10, verse 2, um, toward the end, he says, I, the end of verse 2, I think to be bold against some which think of us as, as if we walked according to the flesh. There's the, Paul is just doing his own thing. They're belittling him. Um, in verse 10, he says, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. There's the externalism, the, 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 the shallow of, of appearance and, and voice. And these guys are, are, are um, always finding fault and scrutinizing Paul, and he's having to defend himself. So in, beginning in chapter number 11, he begins to defend his apostles, apostleship, and you can tell he's getting a bit frustrated because he, he, he begins to lose it a little bit as he, as he goes further along. And he uses, there's, there's eight examples that I have broken down in chapter 11 and 12 where Paul vindicates his apostleship, sometimes even using sarcasm and even self-deprecating humor. Um, the first example is in, is in 11.1. We talked about this, 11.1 uh, and 2. Um, and again, he, begins, he be, almost begins with an apology. Would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. Just put up with this a little bit, please, would you? I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I love you. The first example of Paul, Paul is stating right from the outset that I love you as a, as a dad loves his daughter. And I've, I've committed you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he, is your, he is to be your love and as to be your, your, your affection. Um, but I fear, uh, verse 3, I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another gospel, another Jesus, uh, which we have not preached, or you receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You might listen to these guys. And these guys are coming, and they're coming, and they preach another Jesus. That's a Jesus according to the flesh. Chapter 5, he says, we've known Christ after the flesh, but we don't, fo we don't know him that way anymore. The Apostle Paul presents the risen, ascended, glorified Lord as the head of the church, the body of Christ. He confirms Jesus as the Messiah, but he doesn't preach that as the, as the focus. Another spirit is the spirit of bondage under the law, the, the, uh, the, the spirit of condemnation. Uh, as he says in Romans chapter number 8, there's, there's the legalistic spirit. Or another gospel, um, which you have, uh, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And we're going to see that these people preaching are Jews later in the chapter here. And he says, you might well bear with him. Paul is worried that these individuals that have caught the, caught the eye of the Corinthians will, will corrupt their thinking from the simplicity that's in Christ. When Paul presents the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a simple message. He's all you need. You don't need the tradition. You don't need the... You, you don't need the, 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 the types and the figures and the shadows and the symbols of the rituals, different things. He's all you need. He's sufficient. Um, and that's enough. But you have to have him presented in the right and the proper way. 
so he, he, he's concerned about them in verse 6 verses 5 and 6 he says my life has been an open book we've been thoroughly made manifest among you and then last time we talked about in, in 8, 9 and 10 and 11 we talked about his sacrifice uh, he says I robbed other churches verse 8 taking wages of them to do you service when I was present with you and wanted I was chargeable to no man Paul bragged about the fact that he did not show up with his hand out he did not ask for, for um, compensation. Uh, and yet some of his churches were, were tremendously generous. The Macedonians in particular, he refers to them earlier in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians here. Um, the, the, the Macedonian churches gave multiple times. Poor, struggling, suffering churches. Um, he says earlier in 1 Corinthians, um, they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, but I've used none of these things because uh, I don't want I don't want anybody to to accuse me of having a handout. And as Paul talks about this, as Paul is doing this, it's it, he's he's very subtly comparing himself and his ministry to the other guys, to the other other preachers. Um, and uh, he says I'm I'm not going to stop boasting. Of the fact that I make the gospel without charge. Um, verse 12, but I, what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. That is, those that are just looking for little things to nitpick about me. I don't want to give them any, I don't want to give them any leeway whatsoever. So he, he, he conducted his ministry with, with a great deal of integrity. His life and his ministry was an open book. Um, he says, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, verse 13, transforming themselves into the apostle of Christ, apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If people really knew what the devil was, they, <laughs> but they, they, they're, they're looking at him, they're looking for the wrong thing. They're looking for the red suit and the pitchfork, or they're looking for him preaching the occult. Um, Satan was an angel of light. And last time we looked at the, at the description of him in the book of Ezekiel, every precious stone was his covering. He was perfect in wisdom and beauty till iniquity was found in him. Um, the reality is Satan, as a beautiful angel of light, has a, has a um, self-serving message. His, his goal and his, his purpose is to usurp um, and to, to overthrow. And so he looks, he, if you just look at his appearance, you'd think he's a majestic creature. But uh, he's the enemy of God. He's the wedge driver. He's the, the great des deceiver. He's a liar and the father of it. And as we saw with Eve, he's not opposed to, you, to misusing the Bible. He doesn't come with a, with a, with a neon sign saying, I'm trying to deceive you and, and preach satanic cultic doc he uses the bible and he plays upon the ignorance and the uninformed and the naivete to just like he did with eve and appeals to the natural normal humanness and in that way your minds can be corrupted from the simplicity of just following god's word following god's word for today so we came down through about verse 14 so now he's you you wouldn't recognize satan if you saw him because he's, he's transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. His preachers do not come preaching the occult. They, do, he do not, they, they come, what do they come? They come using the Bible. They preach another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. They use the Bible, they use Scripture, but they misuse the scripture. They fail to rightly divide it. They fail to recognize his, because if they were recognizing what God was doing today, they wouldn't be using. They would be preaching Paul's Jesus and Paul's spirit and Paul's gospel. And, and so Paul is dealing with that. Once again, his ministers, they use religious and righteousness. They're not preaching go out and hang at the honky-tonks and the bars or, 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 or the Ouija, bo Ouija boards or the occult. Satan's ministers are in pulpits today. Satan is a religious being. Um, going, 
go go back to, with me to the um, 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 go back to, with me to Matthew chapter number uh, Matthew chapter twenty three. Matthew chapter number, i tell you what, before that, go to Matthew chapter 16. How did Satan oppose the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth? They, he opposed them with the religious system that was established there. Um, the scribes and the Pharisees were religious individuals. Um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, tempting and desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Um, if you drop down to verse number 5, uh, verse number 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? The Lord uses the analogy of leaven here. Um, Verse number 8, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves because ye have no bread? Do ye not therefore yet understand nor remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves or the four thousand and how many baskets ye took up? Twice the Lord fed the, the masses and the multitudes then. Verse 11, how is it that ye do not no, understand that I spake unto you concerning that I spake not unto you concerning bread that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees the opponents of the Lord Jesus Christ were using the scriptures adding religious tradition um, he, he says that the religious leaders, they're of their father, the devil. They, they boasted that we have Abraham for our father. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Satan, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, opposed his authority and tried to corrupt his role as Israel's Messiah. Satan, when he tempted him, if you be the son of God, challenging him there. Um, in Matthew 23... The Lord addresses, um, in the first 12 verses, he talks about the scribes and the Pharisees, and he warns the people. Um, he says in verse, verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. For they sit in Moses' seat, he says that in verse 2. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. Here's what, here's what religious tyranny does for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and they lay them upon men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers and for all their works they do for to be seen of men they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues religious activity here to corrupt the people they think they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Satan sought to corrupt the kingdom program and the kingdom message and oppose what God was doing here on the earth. But you know the nation of Israel, their kingdom was suspended. And God revealed the Apostle Paul a new message and a new program. And so Satan changed his tactics because God changed what he was doing. And today Satan opposes the gospel of the grace of God. But he doesn't do it with the occult. He does it with religion. He does it with the scripture. He corrupts the, the gospel of the grace of God with another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. And, and, and that's what, what, um, what, is, what is taking place today. And if people are not informed, their minds will be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. Um, let me show you another example of this. Go to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We know uh, our, our, one of our favorite verses is verse number 15. Um, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how you have to handle God's word. 
but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their word will eat as doth a canker like a cancer of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth of erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some see these guys they're preaching Bible but they don't have their timeline right <laughs> they say the resurrection is past they put the resurrection in the wrong spot they're using the Bible but the Bible not rightly divided and and uh, um, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 about the perilous times that will come. Um, he says in verse 5, one of the characteristics is having a form of godliness. That is, they have an outward shell, and if you have a, if you have a shell, it looks like the real deal. Why? Because they're ministering righteousness. But they're preaching another gospel, another Jesus. Um, and they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sin, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning. They're Bible students, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the truth for today. And uh, then he talks about Janus and Jam. My point is, Satan is opposing. He corrupts. He counterfeits, and people need to know the truth in order to active, accurately assess the message. You know what the standard is? The standard is the Apostle Paul, where labors according to the grace that was given to him. Um, and that's the standard. We're to teach no other doctrine, uh, holding fast the form of sound words, the things which we have heard from him. From, from, from me, he says, commit thou to faithful men. And the Corinthians here are entertaining other sources, other voices. And go back to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Therefore it's no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Their works are going to be tried. On the, on the altar of God's word and God's word rightly divided. Um, he says in the book of Philippians, go over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. What's the standard? Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example follow me Paul says he says that in Corinthians a couple of times also um, for many verse um, 18 many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ there are people that are out there um, and if the, you want to be safe follow the apostle Paul uh, they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction the destruction there is the loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, if you don't build on the right foundation, um, your work your work's going to be tried by fire, and the fire will try man's work of what sort it is, and if it's wood, hay, and stubble, guess what the fire does? The fire burns, and there's destruction, and, and they suffer loss. Uh, their, their works are going to be evaluated there. Um, verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They serve their own hearts and their own lusts and their own desire. Their glory is in their shame. They're, who are the people glorying in? They're glorying in the flesh back there in Corinthians. The appearance, the, 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 um, uh, the, the speech, the education, um, the letters after their names, <laughs> whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You know what the earthly things are? It's the earthly program. Um, the, the, the kingdom program. Paul says, follow me. Do you notice that verse 18 and 19 are parentheses? When you're reading your Bible and you see those parentheses, the, the, the parentheses is further explanation. But you could go right from verse 17 to verse 20. 
Just notice how that reads. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. He has a heavenly calling and heavenly ministry, not Christ after the flesh, not earthly things. <laughs> um, they, who's, who mind earthly things? Let me show you something. Go to, go to John chapter 3. Here's a, here's a verse that you hear people use all the time, and they use it in a, with a spiritual application about the need to get saved. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus and Nicodemus, the need for spiritual life. John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, born again, you know what born again is? To be born again is to be born the first time. You know when, you know when they were born the first time? The nation of Israel was born as a nation when they came out of Egypt. Bring forth, let my son go that he may go and serve me, Moses appeals to Pharaoh. Nicodemus, verse 4, saith unto him, how, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus doesn't get it. <laughs> Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There's a spiritual rebirth. Verse 7 is the key. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. That word ye is plural. The Old English has a way of saying you or you all. <laughs> You know, like the Southerns say. When the Lord says a man must be born again, there's a need for personal spiritual life. But the ye is corporate life. The nation of Israel needs a rebirth. Um, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. He talks about the wind. Does that remind you of something in the book of Acts, chapter 2? When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it came as a rushing, mighty wind. That's that spiritual life that comes on the nation of Israel for their national rebirth. It was just the beginning there. It was the first fruits of what was going to happen in the kingdom. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? You should know, Nicodemus, you should know about the national rebirth, rebirth of Israel. Verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak not what we know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Verse 12, If I have told you, what? Earthly things and you believe not, um, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Has he talked to them? When he's talking to Nicodemus, is he talking to, the, to him about earthly things or heavenly things? He's talking about earthly things. The earthly things is the earthly program where the nation of Israel is born of the Spirit that's their born again. They were born of flesh physically as a nation when they came out of Egypt and God delivered them. They'll be born spiritually at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Earthly things, the earthly program. That's what these people preach. They preach, another Je they preach an earthly Jesus and an earthly spirit, the kingdom program, and an earthly gospel. The meek shall inherit the meek shall inherit the earth. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The earthly program. Paul didn't preach the earthly program. Go back to 2 Corinthians.
So what do people preach today? They preach the Bible, but they don't rightly divide it. And that Paul is just another voice. Um, but he's not just another voice. He is the voice for the body of Christ and the new program. So Paul is talking about these false apostles, these false ministers that take and they use the Bible and they corrupt the minds preaching righteousness, but they don't preach the righteousness um, that comes on the basis of God's grace and the Spirit and Paul's message. So Paul, Paul says their ends are going to be according to their works. 2 Corinthians 11. Now watch what he does as he continues to go through the passage here. This is where he begins to lose it a little bit. <laughs> you can see he's getting frustrated. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise yet as a fool, receive me that I may boast myself a little. See how he's... How, I'm, going to ha I'm going to have to talk about myself here. Um... Don't, don't anybody think me a fool, but I'm serious as a heart attack is really what he's saying. Verse 17, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Now verse 17 is not saying that Paul made it up. It's Paul asserting his humanness. A lot of times he says, that, uh, I give my advice or I speak... Um, um, the Lord has given me permission to, to, you know, I speak this not by commandment, but by permission. Well, Paul is, Paul is, his, his humanness is coming through here and his frustration. Verse 17, that which I speak, I sp speak it uh, not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh what are these other guys doing? They're glorying in the flesh. They're glorying in their shame. They're glorying in their pedigree. They're comparing themselves among themselves and by themselves. It's a beauty contest. And Paul's low on the totem pole because his, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contempt, con, con, contemptible. What, what he's doing here, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Okay, I'm going to boast a little bit now. Can continue to boast. Bear with me, will you? <laughs> Do you see how he's, you see his frustration coming through here? Um, seeing that many glory after the flesh, verse 18, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing that ye, are, ye yourselves are wise. You, you, you entertain these other guys because huh, you're so smart. You know, you're, you're, you're above it all. And you suffer these fools gladly. You might, you might bear with them. You want to know what these... Paul's going to describe these guys here. In verse 20. For you suffer... You know, the, and the word suffer there, that's Old English, right? The word means permit or allow. When he says, suffer the little children to come unto me... He's saying, allow, allow the children. That's, a, that's an old English word. You suffer fools gladly. You like these guys. You listen to them. Uh, you suffer, verse 20, if a man bring you into bondage. What did the Pharisees do? They bind heavy burdens upon the people. They, they challenge them with all of this stuff that they need to do and walk and, and how they need to perform. You suffer if a man bring you into bondage. What's the bond? When you think of the word bondage, what do you automatically think of? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of Christ and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's the bondage? The law program. Put you in bondage under the law program. If a man devour you, you know what that is? That's biting words. That is... Uh, you, you listen to some of these preachers and some of you have been places where you, you got to beat people up and make them feel guilty. Biting words. Um, I had one guy tell me, you know, if the preacher doesn't make you squirm, he's not doing his job. You know, it's not my job to make you squirm. It's not my job to beat you up and make you feel guilty. 
uh, I take that devouring to be biting words, to just eat people alive. Um, he, says, he says over in Galatians, people bite and devour one another. You know, you, you know how you bite and devour one another? With a legalistic spirit. You start you know, just chewing away at one another. If a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, what do they take? They take your money. You know what those Pharisees do? They devour widows' houses. How do they devour widows' houses? They take their money. <laughs> they, take their, they take their resources. These guys got their handouts. They're always talking about money. Now, think about this. Contrast this with the Apostle Paul. Does Paul, does Paul bring him into bondage? No, what's, what's he do? He preaches freedom, liberty. You're free in Christ. Does Paul um, devour them? Does Paul speak harshly to them? He almost he apologizes when he has to rebuke. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he, he deals gently and yet firmly with them. If a man take of you, did Paul take anything from him? No, he says, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. I was with you and I was chargeable to no man. I didn't take a red cent from you. I seek not yours but you. I'm preaching, I, I'm, I'm pouring myself into you because I love you as a father loves his children. If a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, the pat on the back, the, the, the self and, 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 uh, and, grise, and, and endizement. Is that, that's, not the, that's not the proper word. Do you see how Paul is talking about these individuals? And if, if the Corinthians are thinking, well, Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't take of us. Paul didn't devour. Paul didn't um, speak harsh words. Paul didn't put us into bondage. Do you see how he's drawn a contrast here? Um, and then he says, if a man smites you on the face. Now you see Paul's exag he's exaggerating here a little bit. You know, they, they didn't obviously slap him up. But Paul is, is, is he's, being, he's, he's talking about the absurd by being absurd. It's his sarcasm here. If a man smites you on the face, these are these, these, are these false teachers. He, these are how these guys are ministering to you. Did I ever do that? No, I loved you. I loved you as a dad loved his daughter. My life was an open book. My sacrifice, I didn't take a nickel from you. I robbed other churches to do you service. And so he's, he's drawing a contrast. Verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I'm going to be bold also. These people are bold and brash when they come. Um... I'm talking about my reproach. And now what he's going to, he's going to use another example. He's going to talk about his sufferings. Paul is going to brag. <laughs> he's going to talk about the hardship he's endured for the work of the ministry. My love, my life is an open book, my sacrifice, and now the true ministers of Christ, here's the suffering. You know why we suffer? Because the world hated the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to hate the ministers of Christ. He says to the Corinthians, he says to the Colossians, we fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. We suffer as an evildoer, even unto bonds. The comparison to these guys that are that are tantalizing and teasing you, Corinthians, do they suffer? Do they suffer hardship for the message that they preach? No, they're living like kings at your expense. I'm going to be bold also. So now Paul is going to begin to talk about the true sufferings of his ministry in his gospel. Verse 22. He, oftentimes in the Corinthian epistles, Paul answers a, asks a question. And he, he, he answers, asks a question and then leaves it 
to you to answer. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? Verse 22. So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So who are these false teachers? They're Jews. They're Jews using Israel's program. Trying to, trying to, they're trying to manipulate and take and control the Corinthians. And Paul says, you guys might, might well bear with them. <laughs> Why does he, go back to chapter 6 for a second. Go back, chapter number 6. Paul does the same thing here. Um, chapter 6, verse 11. Oh, ye Corinthians. We went through this. Our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. I love you guys. I'm, I, 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 I want you. He says, you're not straightened in us. That is, I'm an open... I love you guys. But you are straightened in your own bowels. You're hindered in your opening yourself up to me. You, now for a recompense... Verse 13, in the same, I speak unto you as my children, be ye also enlarged, implying towards me. Love me like I love you, is what he's saying here. Be not ye unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part that he that believeth with an infidel? Implying that there's even some unsaved religious people that Paul or that the, the Corinthians are toying with. That's why he says in verse 17, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. The Corinthians are, are, are toying with a lot of false doctrine and other teachers. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of what, what he says you know, in the, in, the, in the Ten Commandments, you know what the first commandment is? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know why? Because God's a jealous God. <laughs> he wants loyalty to him and to his truth. Paul wants loyalty to him and his gospel and his message. And the Corinthians are toying with, with other, th other things. Listen, as grace people, we need to be very careful as we divide our attention among other teachers and other ministries. Go back to chapter 11. And I guess we'll have to quit. When we, but I just want to read this list in context with you. So Paul is now talking about his suffering. He's going to brag upon, about his suffering. Does any, do these other guys, do they have suffering like me? These Jews? Verse, <laughs> verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm being foolish now. Are you bearing with me still? <laughs> Bear with my folly? I'm speaking foolishly because I have to? You guys have compelled me, he says later on. I, sp I speak as a fool. I am more. Why am I more of a minister of Christ than these other guys? Here's my qualification. Here's my brag sheet. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Now verse 23 is just speaking generally speaking. Labors, that's his work ethic. That's laboring night and day, making tents, doing whatever he... I paid my own bills, I paid my own ways when I had to. In stripes above measure. I've had to give my back to the smiters on a number of occasions because I've had to suffer. In prisons, more frequent. Paul was imprisoned a number of times. When you read the book of Acts, how many times was Paul in prison? When you just read the book of Acts. One time, Acts chapter 16, right? At Philippi, when he was thrown into the into the dungeon, he and Silas. You know what this? You know, there's a whole lot more that happened to Paul than the Book of Acts records. He was in prison multiple times. 
in Acts 13 and 14 and 16 and 17 and 18. The book of Acts doesn't tell us everything that Paul did or every place that Paul went or everything that happened to him. The book of Acts just gives us a snapshot of some of the significant things. That's Luke's purpose. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. He, had, he, he laid his life on the line. Peril, de death threats to him. Those are general things in verse 23. Verse 24, now he's going to get specific. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Five times he was apprehended by the Jews and strapped to a pole and whipped. What do we read about that in the book of Acts? We read about the one time at Philippi. But what about those lewd fellows of the baser sort in, in Thessalonica? He just kind of skipped over that. Not here. Of the Jews, five times I received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. He's, he, he says in verse 24, the Jews got me five times with stripes. Then he says up in verse 23, in stripes above measure, that means the Gentiles got him a few times. <laughs> and we don't, even, we don't even hear about that. Um, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Hey, we know where that is. That's Acts 14 when he was stoned at Lystra and drug out of the city and left for dead. Thrice I, shuff, I suffered shipwreck. <laughs> this, we haven't even gotten to Acts 27 yet when Paul, his voyage to Rome. When Paul hops on these ships and he's going from port to port to port to port, three times the ship went down. <laughs> and Paul ends up without a life preserver, clinging to a piece of wood, probably. Um, Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In verse 24 and 25, you have 12 separate events, specific events. Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he suffered shipwreck. You add that up, that's 12 specific events. Only one of them <laughs> we can find, well, maybe the, the, um, the, the stripes above measure, that was Acts, Acts 16 at Philippi. There's an awful lot that happened. <laughs> See what Paul's brag sheet consists of? His suffering. Any of these other guys, they suffered for the gospel like I've had to suffer. You know the gospel must have, mean, it must have meant an awful lot to him. To go through all of that um, in journeyings verse 26 I said I wasn't going to go through the list but you just once you once you set the set the context you got to go through it in journeyings often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils of mine own countrymen that his own countrymen that be the Jews uh, they were constantly chasing him chasing him down in perils by the heathen, there's the Gentiles. That's how you know the countrymen is the Jews. In perils in the city, is it dangerous to travel in the city? There's some places in Canton you don't want to go after dark. There's a lot of places in Chicago you don't want to go after dark and Cleveland, especially when the when you know defund the police and all that. Perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. What are the perils in the wilderness? Scorpions, snakes, bad weather, heat, uh, you know, um, perils in the wilderness. And perils in the sea. There were times when the ship didn't go down, but it was scary. <laughs> you know, storms and stuff. It was dangerous to travel at this time. It wasn't like you and I today hopping in the car and going, you know, 500 miles in a day. Or jumping on an airplane. Or taking a cruise ship. It was dangerous to travel at these times. Perils in the sea. Perils among false brethren. In weariness, verse 27. And painfulness. In watchings often. 
in hunger and thirst, in fastings often and cold and nakedness. Oftentimes, pe people fast on purpose. Paul says, when I went without food, I just considered it an opportunity to fast in a spiritual sense, not to, to gain favor with God, but just to do it. There were times he went without basic necessities. You know, naked, nakedness, cold, out without having, you know, bring, bring the cloak and so on when, when, I, when you come see me type of thing. So there's Paul's brag sheet. <laughs> and you, you read all, and you know, all of this happened before you get to Acts 21. By the, Paul writes the book of 2 Corinthians in Acts chapter 20, verse 2. That's all of this from Acts chapter 9 through Acts chapter 19. Here's the list of what Paul suffered. He hasn't even been arrested or beaten to death in Jerusalem yet. You know, let alone the, the, the imprisonments through the rest of the book of Acts. What a brag sheet. Paul says, you want to see my qualifications? Here it is. <laughs> any, of the other guy, any of those guys got any of these qualifications? Any of this hardship? Listen, the truth meant a lot to the Apostle Paul. That's the price that he paid to preach the message. He says in the book of, go to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians, the book of Galatians was written quite early. Um, Galatians chapter 6 verse 17. Galatians 6 verse 17. From henceforth let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He had the scars to prove it. That's when Acts chapter, that's Acts 15. He hadn't even gotten to, seven, to Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth yet. You see, see, how he's, you see how he's getting a little bit testy <laughs> here? I've paid the price to preach. Any of these other guys that you're entertaining? No wonder Paul's bodily presence was weak and is and contemptible. He'd been through a lot. <laughs> you'd look kind of tough if, if you'd been through all that stuff too. So Paul says, bear with me a little while I brag on myself. <laughs> you see how he's he's a little he's getting a little bit testy here? <laughs> he says, and you guys don't appreciate my and you're listening to these guys, these abusers? that take your money and put you in bondage and devour you and take your stuff and I have to earn my credentials with you? Let me, let me speak as a fool. See how, how personal this is as Paul is this, is... this gives you a window into the heart of Paul and his heart for the Lord and his heart for the ministry. He went through all of that and he says, I do, I'm a happy man. <laughs> I'm, i I got to preach this message. You know, we don't, we don't put up with much of anything, do we? We've got, we've got it pretty easy. Um, how would we, if we had to pay this price, would we be faithful with the message? Uh, anyway, the Corinthians, Paul is unloading on them. But you see how gentle he is? How, uh, how, compa how, how he's, Bear with me in my folly a minute. <laughs> and he's not even done yet. So we'll stop here. Um, he's going to go on. This is the first four things that Paul says. My love for you, my life is an open book, my sacrifice, and my sufferings. They demonstrate that I'm an apostle. These other guys, do they have those credentials? <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just stop here. But... Um, you see his frustration? <laughs> How people, they be made, they made, they're made rich, and then they drift away because another message sounds more entertaining. The simplicity in Christ is rich, and the gospel of grace is rich. So uh, we'll stop here. Um, but it's just a kind of an interesting window into Paul and his heart, and Paul and his suffering. Um, Acts doesn't tell us everything that he did or every place that he went, but um, here's quite—it's quite a list, isn't it—that he went through.
Um, anyway, do you have a question or a comment? Jim, uh, Bill. scars upon scars yeah. yeah they gave and and oftentimes it wasn't just whips you know this was scourging was a was a serious thing but uh, stripes would probably just be the lashes I would think but it still ain't no picnic it's still ain't no picnic yeah okay father thank you for this window into the life of the Apostle Paul and, uh, and yet his love for the Lord, his love for your son, and the, uh, the debt he felt of, of gratitude he owed for his salvation drove him to, to preach the gospel in spite of all of this mistreatment. And no doubt he expected mistreatment from his enemies. But how, how, how sad it must have been for him to have to defend himself to his friends. Uh, Lord, may, may these things um, encourage us to just be faithful to you um, for the, the, the message is worth it and the truth is worth it um, to work in the lives of, uh, of, of people. May it work in our life and, uh, and uh, produce fruit in our life in spite of the hardships and the difficulties that we face. And help us to do it with, with grace and with gratitude and uh, with a stiff upper lip as we press on and finish our course with the gospel, the grace of God. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay.